Hi, I'm Jeremy. Welcome to another episode of Live Wire Review. Today we did a Q&A session in Midland, Ontario on EVs versus ICE vehicles. But before we get into that, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the service you can expect on an electric vehicle. When you maintain an EV, there are a couple common things in most EVs. Most of them have a liquid cooling system, so there is a coolant you're going to have to change. If I reference the Hyundai products, a Hyundai vehicle will sometimes have a blue coolant, a pink coolant, or a green coolant. The blue coolant is an EV coolant, and that has to be changed every 60,000 kilometers, approximately. And the pink coolant has a different interval, and so does the green coolant. So every vehicle manufacturer is going to have a different interval for changing the coolant. So check your owner's manual, find out what kind of fluids you have in your car, and that will decide when you have to change the coolant. On to the next fluid, brake fluid. That was pretty simple. All cars have brake fluid. You change that once every three years on average. Really, they do recommend two years, but in the industry, we do it about every three years. Now, this prevents water from being absorbed into the brake fluid because it is a hydroscopic fluid and it absorbs water over time. So change your brake fluid every three years. Also, you have to service your brakes. That's the next uh, point I wanted to make. Servicing your brakes is something you have to do yearly in an EV if you live in a salty environment. I do have a video on the channel about spring maintenance on our Tesla vehicle and I showed how to do a brake service. Another maintenance item you might want to consider is an alignment. An electric vehicle is slightly heavier than a gas vehicle. So our Kona Electric, for example, is 400 pounds heavier than the gas Kona. And for that reason, the suspension tends to settle in a little bit sooner on that car than it does on the gas version. Uh, we typically do the first alignment on a gas Hyundai vehicle at around 32,000 kilometers. On the electric vehicles, I like to see the first alignment done around 24,000 kilometers. Another topic that we discuss in this Q&A session for a short and brief period is rust proofing. Rust proofing is an odd topic when it comes to electric vehicles because you're going to find that most electric vehicles written in the warranty, it says do not rust proof. That's because there is a coating on the wires that makes it electrically resistive. The problem with that coating is if you get rust proofing oil on it, the solvents can eat away the coating on the wire over time and then you'll have expensive repairs. If rust proofing oil gets on those wires and it breaks it down, it's going to fail the isolation resistance test. Every time you start your electric vehicle, it actually tests the wiring in the vehicle by itself. The computer will send out about a thousand volts across the wire and self test to see if any of that voltage leaks out. This is one of the ways an electric vehicle is safe because it will test itself before you drive it. But rust proofing oils can break this down over time. Another maintenance item on your electric vehicle will be the tires, just like every other car. They will wear a little bit faster on electric vehicles just due to the extra weight, and especially if you like to take off at every traffic light like I do, then you will wear through tires a little faster. When you go to replace your tires, make sure that they are EV specific tires. A lot of EVs have foam inside the tire to help with the noise. You don't have to get tires of foam in them, but you do have to make sure that they are an extra load tire in most cases. Read the sticker on the door and make sure you follow what tire is recommended for the vehicle. Our Kona Electric, for example, is only supposed to run 17 inch tires because of the extra load. You cannot run the 16 inch tire because the sidewall can't take the extra weight. There are other differences in EV tires, but this is one of the most important things to make sure that the tire can support the weight of the vehicle. One more thing about EV tires, try to get something with a low rolling resistance when you go to replace them. We learned the hard way when you put summer tires on an EV, you are going to lose some range. In our case on the Kona Electric, we decided to get some Firehawk Indy 500 tires just because it's a lot more fun as a lot stickier tire. But in the end, I think we lost about 50 kilometers worth of range because of that sticky rubber. Now I'm going to leave them on there. I really do enjoy these tires, but keep that in mind when you go to replace them. A low rolling resistance tire will give you better range, especially if you match the ones that came on the vehicle when it was new. Alrighty, well, let's start with the basics under here, shall we? I mean, real, real coil down. This is your engine right here, centralized to the entire vehicle. Um, obviously provides power, drivetrain, and actually helps make the vehicle move. In this instance, what is this drivetrain? 
drivetrain is <laughs> engine, transmission, it. drive shafts, rear axle, actually the, the parts of the system that make the wheels move, is okay. the drivetrain. So yep. that's like the, the like Lego wheels capacity yeah. that I would understand from like yep. okay, childhood. It's everything capacity. that makes the wheels turn. Okay, yeah. check. Yeah. Now in this instance, this vehicle is actually a hybrid, so you have a series of hybrid components here, indicated Earth. typically by your orange wires. Orange wires are the scary wires. They are the ones that we don't disconnect unless we absolutely know what we're doing. Yeah, and you don't rust proof anywhere around these because they have electrical resistance in the sides of these wires, which can break down with rust proofing. So basically, orange, that orange is scary. That's the only big thing to know when it comes to these newer electrical vehicles. Yeah, in terms it's, of the older, the older technologies, not older, but the standard technologies that we're all familiar with, you know, checking your own oil, filling up your wiper fluid, that type of stuff, you're okay. If it's orange, just you know, give it a second thought before you think, oh, I'll just go ahead and unbolt this connector over here. Yeah. But on the other hand, scary and bad. Orange they are very, bad. it's very safe though, because every time you turn on the car, there is a, an ohmmeter built into the computer and it actually checks its own wiring every time you hit the start button. You are saying very excellent things, but I don't know what they mean. What's an <laughs> ohmmeter? I was just thinking. Okay, basically it does a cell like, check. I was like, cool, it cool. Will put, I don't know what that is either. These wires can hold um, several <laughs> uh, hundred volts, 400 volts on average. Okay. Yeah. So when the car starts up, it's actually going to send a thousand volts through the wires and okay. make sure that none of it is leaking out to harm right. you. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, so more, don't touch the orange stuff. So more yep. familiar components, uh, the battery. So if you ever had to say boost a vehicle if it was dead, this yes. is your component. And it's labeled very simply with your positive and your negative terminals, red and black, trying to make things very simple. So if you were to ever come out, you know, car's dead, click, won't start. You have a booster pack or a set of jumper cables, as the case may be. You can connect them right there, start the car. Typically. Right there, specifically. Right so. here on the post and on this guy underneath. What is there. the post? You just pointed to it. This right here, the post that, of the battery itself. Okay. That side and that and side. And do you okay, things are but I've never I've been too scared to jump my own vehicle. Even though we've had like a thing that like you plug in and you do it, I was like, I don't know what that is. I'm if pretty sure I'm gonna die. If you're unfamiliar, it can be a you know nerve wracking process to say the least. Um, when it comes to the lower voltage systems Typically, there's not a whole lot you can get wrong. I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's 12 volts. Yeah. There's actually a certain voltage where it becomes dangerous, and that's uh, anything over 48 volts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what? So it can store up to, I'm going to go out on a limb, 800 to 1,000 amps, and that is where you actually get the flow in the system that will run your radios, your lights, or okay. anything else. Yeah. So this is 1,000 volts, and that's a lot more. It, it can 12. be up to a thousand. Yeah, yes. up to. I figured that out from grade one. Yeah, okay. so they taught us something in trade school, um, like <laughs> the, the amps, the volts, and the resistance and stuff. It was like a garden hose. The voltage is the amount of pressure that it's using right. to push the water through the hose. The amperage is how big is your hose. Okay. So with your little kids' walkie-talkies, the hose is only that big. Right. But with these, it's a lot more amperage. Right. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. I'll have a so question, don't lick it. Good. Don't, no, don't I mean, lick don't it. Don't lick it regardless, just yeah. to be safe. Okay. But plus, you never know what's been under here. Um, <laughs> some, other, some other basics. Uh, I mean, I, I, we're, we're familiar okay. with that yeah. emblem. That one yeah. I can do. That one we've all got. Okay, cool. So we can. Actually, how do we show it, Clara? Do you know what this is? Yeah, you open it up. You pour the walkie fluid in. All right. Okay. All right. A, a, a plus for everybody. So if you want to go to the next step to do some of your own maintenance checks. On the side or the front or the back of most engines, you're going to find your dipstick. So you'll actually be able to pull it out and check the oil level. Where did that so come from? I will show you. It's a little bit buried down here. This one came on the side here. Might be a bit of a reach. Now, not every vehicle is so buried. Some are a little more easy. Well, you got height on this. There we go. So for example, that one, you have a low mark, a full mark. And this one is bang on on that full mark. And it's a brand new truck, so the oil is nice and clean. It's not black, hopefully. So these are just very basic checks that you can do on your own. And does it the indicate two, that? The two, the two dots. The dots, okay. The two dots are going to be full and then low. So and your if vehicle it's... will have something similar. It'll have two dots, or it'll have two lines, okay. or a, a hash mark section where as long as the oil is in that range, you're in okay, the safe so that's, range. And what if it's below? If it's below here, you should add, you need to add some. If it's above here, I mean, it shouldn't be above there ever. Okay. <laughs> What is this? That is the air intake tubing. So starting on the actual intake side here, you would have your engine air filter in this little box. That's one of the things we charge you for when you come in for service. I don't work on Fords. There we go. 
So that is your actual air cleaning element there. So as your vehicle is running, air is coming in through here, getting filtered through this guy, and then running directly into your intake manifold and being used to burn whatever fuel it is you burn in that vehicle. Often in an oil change, they might recommend to replace something like that? Yeah, it's something that we inspect typically with a, uh, with a multi-point inspection. And then we'll come out and say, hey, this one's really dirty. Or as the one I had this morning was, oh, a rodent's been living in this one for a few months. You might want to consider changing this one. Yeah, it can make up to a 10% difference in your fuel mileage. Yeah. Inside. Now, what do you think you're going to find under here? Well, I feel like Frank gave it away. Yeah. Yeah. Like so what's going to be in this? It's not powered. It's not a Not powered? <laughs> oh, it is. Look, there's nothing there. It's like you're driving a Porsche. <laughs> Except for there's also a trunk in the back. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, I'm liking the frunk. <laughs> this That's says everybody. electrical stuff is behind <sighs> up or something yeah it's definitely hidden behind here this stuff you can actually power things from your house in here which is kind of oh. cool you were powering a toaster oven and everything yeah, else at your did, place uh, we did a toaster was... oven a kettle uh, a couple other things on the nose of this the one day it so was is pretty this fun a fully electric vehicle it is fully hydro? electric okay. yes yeah. so the easiest way to explain this one is if you ever used a power drill so okay. the way i explain it at work is we have these power drills that we used to forward and back and whatever they have a motor in them uh in which there's uh to get the speed out of it it puts a magnetic field slightly ahead of everything. And so my drill works exactly the same as my car. It's got a battery in it, it's got a computer that controls the motor, and that's about it. So the only thing you have to think about in this one is there is a cooling system, there's a couple fluids to change, and not much else. Why are we just getting around to these now? Is, is the answer legislation? Because of batteries. Batteries are expensive. Okay. The materials for and them heavy. are very expensive and very heavy. So okay. my car is, typically, is about 400 pounds in, 400 pounds heavier than a normal car okay. unless you compare the same one side by side and this one is probably what a thousand pounds heavier at least i'd say yeah i think this one's at least a thousand pounds heavier right yeah okay um and also like oil billionaires and stuff probably too yeah well they're very cheap to drive in my own car it cost me two dollars and eight cents to go to wonderland and back from here right yeah right. this truck would oil probably be around eight eight bucks or something okay. Yes, okay, yes, excellent. Um, but how do you, you, you don't go to the gas station? Nope. No, they have something called a fast charging station, which is actually over here. So when you charge at home, you'll have a connector just like on your cell phone. They have a special connector for electric cars. You plug it in here and there's a relay on the wall and it turns it on when you need to. When you're on the road, you use the second port. There's a really big connector that plugs into here and then it charges up in about anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes depending on what right. charger you go to. And how frequently does it need charging? Depends on the car you get. So right. we were testing a Nissan Leaf the other week and that one will go 240 kilometers on a charge and then there's the Ionic 6 that we had at work and went 581 kilometers on a charge. So it really depends on what you're getting. I think this one sits around 350 to 400? Yeah, somewhere in that Two range. I think. Standard and extended. This one's just a standard range, so you're closer to the 350, and then extended would be closer to I'd say standard range would probably be in the 250 to 300 range, honestly. Depending on the time of year. Yeah, and if you tow with an electric vehicle, it it's really not that great. It's about 50% of the range when you tow a giant trailer with it. You'd be surprised to know that I don't tow things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but when you do tow something, it tows it amazingly well. You can go up a hill full throttle and you won't even so, know it's there. Like, okay. You so, can, sorry, you can you can charge this like just like at your house? Like you just need the special end and yep. no, no rewire? It's a one-time installation and you can charge any electric car with it. Yep. So that sounds like a thing that works really well for people that do substantial daily commutes Yes, actually, the more you drive an electric vehicle, the cheaper it gets. And the reason for that is because a, an electric battery degrades two ways. One is from mileage and use, and the other was from time. And you can never escape time. If you bought this and you only drove 10,000 kilometers in 10 years, you've used up your battery's life regardless. Because right. you'll get about um, 10 to 15 years. 10 years if you had a, a bad battery and a cell went bad, then you'd have specialists who would go in there and they right. would change out the cell. That would be about as expensive as, uh, say, rebuilding a transmission. There's a company in the States who's doing it for about five grand right now. Right. So that's, that's that scenario. But otherwise, you get about 15 years out of a battery 
on average, and then you actually get to sell it to somebody afterwards because it's used in a house afterwards uh, for yeah. grid storage. Cool. Yeah, so you're gonna get about 25 years out of the total life of the battery, and then at the end, uh, they're gonna recover about 92% of the materials just by recycling. So this is good, we like this for the environment. Yeah, now, everything we do has an effect on the environment, but this has less of an effect right. on the environment, but yes. I suspect, okay, so I live at Pizza Pizza, and I work at the high school. Mm -hmm. My commute is, I think, three kilometers. Yeah. This is very nice, but I feel like this is going to cost a lot more money. You'd be in the camp with Matt. You'd like the Nissan Leaf. There are there are cheaper applications in the battery electric space that you'd be interested in. Oh yes, like definitely. This big or this right. expensive. Like we drive a Hyundai uh, Kona I electric. Feel like <laughs> the killings have a Leaf. I have no idea. I feel like, like Christine was at the house I feel like a few weeks ago the, and she was explaining it to me. To have a Leaf, it would they be would them. be them. And she's <laughs> and explaining it to me and she's like, yep, and I drive it to Georgian College and yeah. they have a plug in anything. Yep, and they sure do. And that was, was like, on the GPS the other day. I was like, cool. I don't, this all sounds very confusing, but I'm. But, oh, it's so simple to live with because you plug in at home, you never visit a gas station again. Right. You leave, you leave full, you leave with a full tank every morning. It's like yeah. having a gas pump in your garage. Right. So you drive, but like, you the time that you night. need to go visit yeah. your brother oh, in Montreal. Oh, so that's the other thing with batteries. Um, it's a little bit different maintenance than if right. you had a gas car. A gas car, you fill it up because it's just liquid. Yeah. Batteries are funny things. They like to be between 40 and 60%. So if you want your car to last a lot longer, then you don't charge it to 100%. You set a charge limit inside the car and you charge to that limit every single day. Because if you charge a small amount, it's better for the battery than a large amount. Okay. Yeah. It's just one of those things you get used to. My cell phone battery as well? Yes, actually. My cell phone in my pocket, I limit it to 85% so that it lasts longer. I'll get more than twice the life out of it. How do you do that? Do you tell it to stop charging once it's My old phone? Yeah, my old phone, I couldn't do that. My new one has a charge limit on it. It's like, an option you can click. Plug it in, and then in the morning, it's at whatever. And most cars, yes, you can do that with it. But we found out the other day the Nissan ones you can't. But they do block out the top bit of the, the battery that, so you can't use it just to protect it um so you talked about the added weight on a vehicle like this mm -hmm. does that mean it's extra safe that depends on the manufacturer most electric cars have a lot of good structures to them and the weight is down low so rollover risk is almost zero it's a certain it's a common it's a common trait of all if not most evs at this point yeah because the batteries are down low it's this planted feeling that it's it's tough to describe until you get by. Oh, it, okay. yeah, it's it's addictive because. No matter what kind of vehicle, you've got it. You know, like Polestar Star Two, just sitting right there in the light that I haven't seen in a while. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of just a, a lot of electric vehicles coming. Is that in the electric? Building. That is that yep. blue one sitting or the gray one sitting at the light there. Um, yeah, because I just know. I just oh, we're car guys. Right. Yeah, we know them all. <laughs> But yeah, it, it's a feeling that you'll get when you actually drive one. And it's, it's not like anything. It's like driving a go-kart or a race car. You're going to have to do an alignment about 10,000 kilometers earlier. So about 24,000 kilometers, you do your first alignment. Because that extra weight Early just tends to then a gas-powered car. Okay. We do it at about 32,000 on a gas-powered car. But that's because the extra weight just settles the suspension in a little bit. And your tires, they end up squeezing out a little bit. So that's why we do an alignment, is to bring it back because when you drive away, your tires go like that a little and straighten out. So as they settle, they go outwards and they scrub the tires. So first thing is alignment. Second thing is you service the brakes once a year in the spring, just because we're in a salty area, everything, especially the inner pad, gets stuck. So service the brakes once a year, do an alignment. Uh, 100,000 kilometers or so, you're probably gonna change one fluid in the drivetrain. Well guys, that's the end of the Q&A session and it's the end of the episode. I need some ideas from you. I need to know what we're going to do in the future. What kind of questions do you have? What do you want to know about maintaining your EV? Make sure to give us a like and subscribe down below and see you next time.